All right, so today we're checking out a brand new cinema camera called the Marvel Edge 6K. It is made by a company called Kinefinity. You may or may not have heard of them before, but I have made one video about them. And if you happen to be one of those that viewed that video when that came out, that was over two years ago. Isn't that crazy? Over two years, that's a long time. Now in that video, I was generally impressed with the image quality, the performance, the capabilities it had, but it still felt like it still needed quite a bit of refinement. So I wanna go into all the things that they changed, what's been improved, is there still problems with it? They actually gave me this camera. Literally, they are just like, here, you go. And I was like, what? You think you could bribe me by giving me a camera? As I was like packing it up, so you get the, that sweater. You have that in a large? Give, give, give me. But you know, I'm allowed to say whatever I want and you know, I don't have to like promote their logo. It is pretty crazy, but I feel like they must have a lot of confidence in it uh, to, to give it to you. This is going up on eBay tonight. We're getting our bathroom remodeled. Fine, I'm just kidding. I'm also trying out this lens that was sent to me from Cropped. I don't know, but it's a heavy lens. I should really be using a lens support for it, but let's just say I'm stress testing the lens mount. So let me go ahead and hit record real quick and just kind of see what kind of footage I get. So let me go ahead and shoot back at the Sony here. Now, of course, being a YouTuber, I need a camera that I can vlog with. So this is what it would look like if I just started vlogging on this camera. Like, hey, Carrie, how you doing? Are you having fun walking the dogs? This seems very practical. Yeah, does it look really nice? I think it actually looks pretty nice. we get into it let's try to figure out what this camera is and who is it for well first of all it has a full frame 6k sensor there is a 3 by 2 open gate setting and it records anything between ProRes proxy all the way to ProRes 4444XQ now one of my big complaints with the previous one was I hated the EF mount on there but this one feels so good and it has that positive lock to really secure it in one of my favorite features is the built-in variable ND and it is a electronic ND. Now I love electronic NDs because you can adjust these at 0.03 stop increments and most variable NDs use polarizers, which is great, it's convenient, it's easy and doesn't require electronics, but it can screw with your image a bit if you're filming screens or certain parts of the sky. So basically how it works is I activate it and you'll see it slide in and at the base it's at 0.6 ND, so that's basically two stops, but then I can slowly roll it up and make it denser up to 2.4 so that is a total of eight stops now if you want to switch from the ef mount to a pl mount it is completely toolless so that makes it a lot easier there is also an lpl mount and also a e mount now the ef mount does have those contacts so you can adjust the aperture electronically on a lot of ef lenses but the e mount does not so it will only work on the lenses that don't require electronics to power it's going to be more for the manual lenses or anamorphic lenses that are starting to come out for e-mount so that could be really cool d-squeeze settings are right here in the camera now this is still beta firmware so there are still more upgrades to come from what i'm testing right now like uncompressed raw but in the prores setting you can also shoot at lower resolutions like 4k and it'll scale the image in the camera so you're not dealing with any sort of crop even at lower resolutions at least in prores now if you want to shoot with some super 35 lenses or you have some aps-c lenses then you can go into the super 35 mode and still maintain 4k i mean you could even go super 16 at 2k or micro four thirds at 3k so between all the different image formats and different mounts you got a huge list of lenses that you can throw on here this is a v mount plate but you can also power the entire camera with one of these i think it's really cool that they give us so much flexibility i mean there's dual card slots here and this is their kinemag it's a one terabyte right there but you can also get something like this you can literally open this up and stick your own two terabyte ssd in here you also don't need a card reader because you can just pull this out and there's a USB-C port right there which just connects to your computer loads up as a drive now the last Kinefinity I tested out was probably the worst user interface I've ever seen but this is so much better so this is your quick specs right here so at a glance you can see what's going on the touchscreen just makes sense now which is great there's your white balance and base ISO is at 800 and the high ISO because it's dual native is 5120 I like seeing this PTAP right here to power like a wireless video feed or follow focus and two SD 
HDMI ports. Very important to have too because these can get blown out sometimes. And if you're gonna take away one thing from this video, it should be to always use shielded SDI cables. Look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about and you will thank me later. Now this five inch display is full HD and has 2000 nits, which is very important if you're trying to see it in the bright daylight. You can see the monitor is plugged into this port right here and there's an identical one down here which the viewfinder is currently connected to. They also just recently came out with a seven inch version of this display and I'm honestly kind of tempted to get it. It could be a pretty sweet setup. All that sounds awesome, right? But before I can officially get my thumbs up or thumbs down on this camera, I really have to see the final version of the firmware. And until I get to test that version of the firmware, I really don't know how solid this camera is because if it's still gonna be glitching after the final firmware, like I'm not interested using this in a professional setting. But if they really clean this thing up, it can really change a lot of things. So make sure you check down there in the comments, especially if you're watching this further up ahead in the future. But anyways, let's go ahead and cut to some footage from Christmas. Here it is. Feels nicer. Yes, and now we've integrated the Kinney back into the camera body itself. So you'll notice the XLR ports are on it. Oh, this is interesting. I don't know where this is going, but I'm interested. <laughs> it's, a, it's a camera base plate. It's for hot swap, is right, that? Right, right. Okay. There's gonna be a little green light indicator on the side. Oh, okay. And so if it's green, then you're good to hot swap. Oh, so you guys made your own? Yes. Do these charge faster than the Sony ones, by chance? They do, actually. <laughs> so you're telling me you were able to fit ND filters in that tiny little slot mm -hmm. right there? Under here. It is a variable ND system. Is it electronic or? Yes. Uh, oh, yes. It is. I think that my favorite thing about the previous camera was that it had oh, the mount with the mount. Yeah. yeah, so now we don't do that anymore. We have it built into the camera. So you don't need to put ND in the mount anymore. I see many improvements in the menu. <laughs> it's a lot more streamlined. Yeah. You can okay. also use the touch screen. Other little nifty exposure trick that we want to show you, if you shoot in ISO mode all the time, uh, you probably shoot in EI mode as well, which mm -hmm. you can toggle between EI mode and, and ISO mode. But if you're in ISO mode, we have a thing that's super handy. My window is pretty blown out. We are at our base native ISO of 800. Mm -hmm. And if you notice this number right there, it says 4.3. Mm -hmm. That's referring to how many stops are in your highlights. You can actually prioritize more highlight stops so you can kind of shift your dynamic range a little bit and watch what that did. You have more detail in your highlight. But it still maintains the ISO 800? Yes. My brain's hurting on how you guys do that. So do you offset the ISO and then gain it? Like we all try really hard to understand like what it's really working behind what we are seeing. It's a tight seat. Yeah. Yeah. If you're gonna get more highlights, then you gotta pull from the shadows, yeah. right? Well, yeah. so you do. It, Shadow detail is going to get a little muddier if you go up to a higher point. But at six highlight stops, you should be fine. What's default? ISO 800 is six. And then total dynamic range? 14. 14. Yeah. These are channel one and channel two. It also records a channel three and four, which can be assigned to the stereo 3.5 mil input. But there's also an internal microphone that you can use for reference. So this can also be assigned as channel three and four. Then when you download the files, the ProRes files will have four audio channels tied to it, but there's also four separate wave channels that are mono. So right now I'm viewing a LUT, but I can always switch it over to view log, but this only records in log, which some people might be like, oh man, I wanted to have a look baked in, but really I think it's actually a good thing because the last thing I want to do is accidentally shoot with a LUT baked in. What do you think about this camera, Dylan? Seems pretty epic. Yeah? Yeah. Are you just saying that because it looks big? Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> like three people have come up to us and be like, wow, you must be doing something serious. Nah, I'm just filming a YouTube video. <laughs> yeah, battery life on these aren't that great, but you know, V-mounts will last you a whole lot longer. I do love that. I can hot swap. I'm getting kind of spoiled with that. Dylan, what's a hot box? A hot swap, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> hot box is a different topic. Now you'll notice that there's a number one and number two on the viewfinder as well as monitor. So the way I remember is one is for exposure. So you want to do that first. So one, and then you hit your focus with number two. So if you short press one, you're going to get that histogram to pop up. And if you long press it, you actually get false color, which is my personal favorite way to expose, but you just kind of have to get used to it. So whatever you want. And actually, if you press this button up here, you get waveforms right here 
on the bottom right. So you got the three main tools for exposure. So definitely a requirement to call something a cinema camera. After you got your exposure in, number two is for focus. So it does that zoom in. And as of right now, I can only scroll left and right, but that's because again, it's early firmware, but we're supposed to be able to slide up and down too. You long press it and then the options for peaking come on and off. I kinda wanna see what it would look like if I just made this into like an ultra lightweight setup. This is like a contact Zeiss lens. Like if I don't want this viewfinder here. Hey Dylan, can you hold this for a second? Let's see how Dylan's camera operation skills are. I could take the monitor off of here. It's pretty modular, so I can throw it over there and swing it this way, which is nice. I wanna make this setup tiny. Let's do it. So this is one of my earliest lens purchases. I had this thing since I was a little winky. Winky? Does that make sense? Oh, what a wrong word, huh? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, what's winky? <laughs> I don't know. Please cut that part out. <laughs> no. Let me get this base plate off. I'm just using like the one that came with my sockler. But you can see you can attach a tripod, but this also fits in a dovetail. I like seeing things that I've never seen before. That's what I really give credit to Kid Affinity for. You know, putting in batteries into a base plate so you could hot swap. Yeah, that's not bad. Just trying to shoot a movie and you don't want to get kicked out of all your locations because you're too poor for a permit because you're not a major studio. And we're just like, just pay for a $4,000 film permit, you idiot. So you could film here. You're like, I'm just this film student. We're about to lose the sun. Let's go. Come here. All right, Don, it's time for you to look cool now. Okay. It is so cute. Tiny little camera. We got our finalized technical specs in, so let's take a look. 3.6 pound body, zero to 40 degrees Celsius, so that's pretty standard frame rate. So at 6K, we're dealing with about 58 if we're going by that 16 by nine HD aspect ratio. The more we trim off the top and bottom, we can get up to 75 in 6K. The more exciting stuff definitely comes in when we go into that Super 35 mode, so there's less of the sensor to read. Yeah, 112 frames per second if we do that 4K in DCI mode, so slightly wider. So it's not as simple as like a 4K 120, 1080p 240, it's uh, uh, really depends on how much of the sensor, how much you need to process. If you want to get that intense slow-mo, you're going to go deeper into your crop. So micro four thirds, you could hit 195. Top speed is 290 frames per second, but at super 16 2K HD and wide. So very limited frame there. And we got our codex, our looks. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention is in the front, there is a lens port. So if you want to plug in your follow focus motor. Now it is a six pin limo. So it would be convenient if you had this Move cam follow focus unit, which apparently uses a six pin. But I tend to use the tilt a nucleus. I don't know if there's going to be a way to convert that with a cable or whatever, but for now I will be powering it off the D-tab. I also did some split screenshots with this and the A7S III, which actually looks surprisingly close considering that this A7 IV is $2,500 and the A7S III is $3,500. You know, I think a lot of people are just going to go, you know what, give me the A7S. But the difference is really in the type of sharpness. The way I see it, there's a difference between something being sharp and then there's something being sharp because it's been sharpened. The A7S a lot of times does look really sharp and crisp and I love it. But I would say the Marvel Edge looks very natural. It's really doing a good job of capturing what's actually there opposed to processing it in a way where it just looks like it's a little bit punchy. If we scale in 500%, you could really see the amount of details in the pores, which is definitely a sign of sharpening there. Now sharpening stuff really helps make things look really crisp, but you can really start to see some of the side effects of doing so. Sometimes it could accentuate things that are not actually there opposed to something with a ton of horsepower, which will only really collect the information that's in front of that lens. Sharpness is great, but not usually on skin. And they did give me a big heads up that, hey, the firmware is still being worked on. So expect quirks. And I'm gonna list everything I see down there in a pinned comment down below, which is why I say check the comments because as I get the updated firmware and all that, I'm gonna update that down there because YouTube doesn't let me update these videos, unfortunately. So just go down there, check what the latest is and yeah, that is all end tag time. Thank you so much for watching. And I am just gonna sit here and just be sad that it's raining when we're supposed to be out flying drones. <sighs>